Let's talk a little bit more about uh, uh, sparse coding, and you'll hear a lot more about this uh, from, from Stan Osher uh, in the following week, and probably from a few other people, at least on the, the sparse coding part of it, not a, necessarily on the auto encoder part. Uh, but I just want to uh, tell you a bit more um, about this and about the particular algorithms that are used for, uh, for that. So as you may remember um, from uh, Andrew, Andrew's lecture and mine yesterday, uh, sparse coding is based on uh, encoding uh, input vectors with a, a sparse vector z. Um, and the, the way you find the sparse vector z is by minimizing this energy function, assuming this matrix WD dictionary matrix is, is known. Uh, and you can learn this dictionary matrix using gradient descent by simply um, uh, you know, plugging a, a y, finding the z that minimizes this energy function, computing the gradient of this term with respect to WD, and update, updating this uh, WD matrix uh, so as to go down in the gradient direction, and then normalizing the column so that the norm is less than 1. Okay, very simple algorithm. What I did tell you is how do you minimize this function with respect to z? And there's a whole bunch of algorithms for this, some of which uh, came from UCLA, as a matter of fact. Um, and um, I want to tell you a little bit about that. Right, so, um, so it started out uh, in, in applied math with something called uh, business pursuit. And the, the idea is, was to uh, actually solve this, this problem, which is to uh, find a z here that minimizes this uh, squared error below a certain error, but then minimize the number of terms in z that are non-zero, which is the L0 norm of, uh, of the z vector. But that's kind of uh, an intractable problem. Uh, there are approximate solutions, one of, one of which is called uh, basis pursuit or uh, matching pursuit or um, um, ordered uh, matching pursuit, which is kind of a, a greedy version of it. And it's a very simple algorithm. It's very uh, fast, but it's very unstable. So th this is the criticism that Jeff was talking about yesterday, that when you change the input a little bit, the representation, the z vector, may change completely, because it will choose a different set of basis functions to represent it. And so you'll have no notion of, um, of, of kind of similarity in the space of, uh, of features. And so this uh, L1 uh, formulation is, is quite a bit more stable, uh, although it's still fairly unstable. Um, and there are sort of proofs that they are more or less equivalent as L1 and L1 are equivalent to the certain conditions. Um, so the, uh, the, the problem we are facing to, to find the z here is to minimize the sum of two functions, and, uh, a quadratic function, and it's sort of non-smooth uh, L1 function. But this function is relatively simple because it's, uh, it's only coordinate per coordinate. Um, and so it's, you, you can formulate the general problem like this, convex smooth. Uh, uh, you know, Lipschitz constant just means that you know, it's well behaved. And uh, uh, convex and non-smooth on this, on, the, on this side. And so what you can do is some sort of uh, quadratic approximation of this function around the point z prime. And, uh, and kind of split, uh, and I'm sure Stan will talk about this, um, uh, kind of you know, split the, um, the, uh, the cost function into two terms so that when you make z equal to z prime, you get the, uh, the original uh, criterion. Um, but that allows you to optimize with respect to z first, and then with respect to z prime, and then back to respect to z again, back to respect to z prime again. And, um, and so this is kind of this sort of alternated uh, 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 algorithm idea. Um, so, so when you work it out, um, you get something a bit like this. So, so you figure out, you know, how should I uh, change z so as to minimize the, the quadratic term taking into account the, the z prime, so it's basically minimizing this term. Um, and then how should, you know, how should it take into account the, the, uh, um, the influence of, uh, of g? What you get is this uh, algorithm called uh, ISTA, Iterative Shrinkage and Thresholding Algorithm. So basically it consists of taking the gradient of the f function with respect to z at a particular point, multiplying it by some constant. So this is just kind of like a gradient step. Okay? This whole operation here says, uh, you know, go down in the direction of the gradient of, uh, of the negative gradient of the quadratic term. It's nothing more, right? Uh, that's just a gradient equation, gradient update equation. Zk, you know, equal, uh, you know, update z by uh, subtracting uh, some constant times the gradient. And L is an appropriately chosen step size, if you will. 
Um, and then the next step is to take into account the effect of the G function, the L1. And uh, you can work out analytically what the optimal solution is. And it consists in simply shrinking all the values that you get from this. So you take the values of, the values of this vector, which are the same dimension as, uh, as Z, and you shrink all the components towards 0. Okay, so using a function like this. So this corresponds to the L1 regularizer. If you had another regularizer instead of uh, L1 here, you would get another shape for this. Um, but for L1, you get the shrinkage function. Um, and you just sort of keep doing this. Um, so if you write it down explicitly as a function of the, the D matrix, you get, uh, you get this, right? So you start from ZK. Um, oh, this should be ZK, by the way, here. Uh, you multiply it by the dic dictionary matrix, um, compute the error. Uh, this is kind of the reconstruction error term, if you want. Hit it with the transpose of D, um, multiply by some constant, and then subtract that from the, uh, from the current Z that you have, shrink, and then that gives you the next ZK, and then you iterate. So it's a very simple algorithm, iterative shrinkage and thresholding. Um, and uh, and you, you, know, you keep going until the convergence of some criterion is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, 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 is reached. So it's called ISTA. Um, and so there's a fast version of, of it called FISTA, which um, kind of uh, finds um, fast iterative shrinkage and thresholding algorithm, um, which uh, uh, computes the, uh, the, the step size uh, appropriately and makes it a little faster. OK, so for learning D, as I, as I was saying before, is just a matter of computing the gradient of, uh, of this term with respect to D. And so it's very, uh, and then you constrain the elements of D to be, or the columns of D to be unit norm. So as, as, uh, um, as Andrew was saying before, and I was saying as well, uh, any reasonable algorithm like this will give you um, Gibor filters when you apply them to natural image patches, and, uh, or, or parts of uh, characters if you apply this to, uh, to you know, things that are formed they can be constructed by parts. So these are the columns of the, of, of the, the dictionary matrix. Um, so interesting uh, pointer is there is um, a very efficient piece of uh, software written by Julien Meral at uh, INRIA uh, called SPAMS. And it's a you know, nice, quick, parallel uh, C or C++ implementation of, of sparse coding. And that's the one everybody uses. So if you want to play with this, uh, you might want to use that. Um, and it's used for uh, uh, you know, all kinds of, uh, it also has a nice tutorial about this. Um, and uh, there's lots of applications of sparse coding. So those, these come uh, from, from Julien Meral and from uh, other people. So things like uh, image denoising. So the, the basic idea of uh, using sparse coding for image denoising is that you, um, you, um, you take a patch, and you, you, might, you might hear about this from, uh, uh, from Rob Fergus as well is you take a patch and you find um, sort of the closest reconstruction of this patch that is also sparse in the uh, sparse representation. And then you use the reconstruction and you do this over all patches, overlapping patches and compute the average and does a pretty good job at reconstructing image. Uh, if you know, if you have um, clubbed pixels and you know which ones they are, you can also use the neighboring pixels to try to reconstruct. And so that's the result of doing in-painting using the sparse coding again. Um, uh, it can be used also for video restoration. Then you can use uh, spatial temporal consistency uh, for digital zooming. Uh, this is uh, kind of cute um, for, uh, again, digital zooming. Um, so unfortunately, this, this is not particularly fast or real time, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's practical. Uh, so Jean Meral had this idea of using this for, for inverse half-toning. So you have a half-toned image. And you want to reconstruct the grayscale, so, and you know, feed the image. You, you train it on a dictionary for um, on, on pairs of images, I guess, uh, clean and half-toned, and you uh, figure out the sparse representation uh, in the half-tone, and then you can reconstruct in the uh, in the grayscale, essentially. Uh, so this is a nice reconstruction. Tetris. Here we go. Back from the eight-bit world. Actually, that's one bit. Um, or, you know. So, um, right, that's a really good job if you zoom in. 
Uh, it can be used for recognition. So there's a, a whole series of work, which I'll talk about later, on how to use uh, sparse coding to extract features for recognition. And as I said um, um, the day before yesterday, is, it's, it's really useful f for mid-level features, uh, mostly. Um, and so um, some of those ideas, which I'm not going to go into the details of, really use uh, uh, sort of uh, so somewhat supervised learning for, for training the, the features, but not necessarily. Some of them are entirely unsupervised. So there's a, a series of work by uh, Ilan Bourreau, who is a former student of mine, uh, uh, and um, to, to learn mid-level features for object recognition. There was some work by uh, uh, KU's group. You, you'll hear from KU at the end of the, uh, of, of the, of the summer school uh, when he was at ADC. Um, to use sparse coding. And, and this is used very widely in uh, uh, sort of mainstream uh, pipelines for object recognition and computer vision. And there's a bit of a history of uh, evolution of the architecture for mainstream computer vision systems where people first uh, started computing feature descriptors like SIFT features uh, at interest points only in, uh, in an image. Interest points are points where you, you, know, uh, you have lots of corners, for example, typically. So you get a, a, you know, a fixed number of, of, uh, of features, but they, you don't know where they are in the image. And so uh, you, you take those feature vectors, typically there are 128 dimensions, and you, uh, you do uh, vector quantization on them to expand the dimension to say 1,000, and then you just uh, average them out. You compute the average of all those uh, 1,000 dimensional one of n uh, vectors, okay, um, obtained through vector quantization. So you get lots of zeros, only one one, average them all, you get kind of a histogram of how many times each prototype has been chosen within the image. And then you feed that to a classifier. So it's kind of the old way of doing things. Uh, people since then uh, started using dense features, so either SIFT or HUG or whatever. Um, so you have kind of a regular grid of, of points in the image where you extract those features. You again do vector quantization, again do sort of a, an averaging using a coarse grid. Um, and then you, f you feed that to your favorite classifier. Um, and, and the sort of more recent version is to use, uh, again, sort of low level features, whatever you want. Uh, and then replace the vector quantization by sparse coding, and, and then using, again, uh, kind of a cross grid or a spatial pyramid and various types of pooling, and, um, and then feed that to a classifier. And that's kind of what works best, uh, what works best more or less. Um, so I was referring to those paper, so this is from Caius group at uh, NEC, and this is uh, Ilan Bouro's paper. Um, and some of those use uh, supervision to drive the dictionaries to be more appropriate for the, for the test. Um, and I'm not going to go into this, actually. Okay, so as I said yesterday, sparse coding is great, but uh, it's kind of slow. Although there are, there's recent work to make it really fast, uh, based on hash, um, hash table. There's an upcoming paper by a, a former postdoc of Stan Osher, who's here, and former postdoc of mine as well, um, Arthur Schlamm, uh, to, uh, to compute sparse coding by uh, uh, figuring out first what the uh, active set, what set, what what the subset, what which, which subset of business function is going to be used for a particular input, um, and um, and doing this instead of uh, doing the L1 minimization to to find that he uses kind of a hash table kind of trick, and and then once you know the active set, uh, finding the the value of the coefficient is extremely simple. It's just uh, solving a linear system essentially. Okay, so what, what needs to be accelerated is the, the part where you find the active set. And, and he used this, uh, this, this uh, hashing uh, method, which works really well. It's an upcoming paper at uh, uh, ECCV. Um, okay, and then the method I, I talked about yesterday, uh, I alluded to uh, Monday, is the, uh, is the idea of using an encoder, a feed forward model of a known complexity to predict. Uh, to give a prediction of what the, what the optimal sparse code is and to train this uh, feed-forward model um, essentially using backprop or using you know, whatever learning algorithm you want. So you can give this whatever architecture you want and you can train this using uh, backprop if this is multi-layer or whatever gradient descent algorithm you want and you generate pairs of training samples, an input as well as a corresponding sparse code which is obtained by minimizing this, uh, this function and then you train this, uh, this part. Um, the better way of doing this is to optimize this whole thing at once, so you, you simultaneously uh, train the encoder and the decoder, and so when you find the optimal code is, um, for a particular input, it's the one that minimizes 
not just the reconstruction error and the, and the sparsity, but the reconstruction error, the sparsity, and the prediction error, so that whatever code is generated here is not too different from whatever the encoder is able to predict. So it biases the system towards um, learning basis functions that, are, uh, uh, that produce a spark code that are easily uh, predictable by the, uh, by the encoder. So the particular instance of this was pass coding. So by the way, this is a fairly general idea. So if you have a complex algorithm that, uh, with an inference algorithm that, um, sort of a method with an inference algorithm that produces uh, uh, variables, latent variables through minimization, and you're tired, of, you're tired of waiting for it, what you might want to do is uh, train a feedforward predictor to give you the correct value of these on the particular uh, set that you are interested in. Uh, so as I said Monday, you can't really expect to train a system like this with a kind of a simple uh, amount of a small amount of computation to, to do a good job at predicting all the, all the possible Zs for all possible Ys. Um, but you're only interested in the optimal Zs or, or close to optimal Zs for a subset of Y, the ones that correspond to, say, natural image patches if you do speech recognition or you know, audio samples if you do uh, uh, audio processing. So, um, so that's, where, that's where the win uh, uh, resides. Um, so that's the you know, particular cost function, uh, energy function you can use for, for linear decoder and a particular type of nonlinear encoder. And the simplest one you can imagine is basically one step of ISTA, one step of iterative shrinkage and thresholding algorithm. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a matrix here. We're going to take the input, we're going to multiply the input by the by a matrix which is the same size as the transpose of the dictionary matrix. We're going to shrink all the components, and that's going to be our function here. Okay, it's very simple, and this is the first iteration you do when you do uh, iterative shrinkage of thresholding. You will do this, uh, except that when you do iterative shrinkage of thresholding, what you use here is the uh, transpose of WD. Here we're not going to use the transpose of WD, we're just going to learn that matrix. And we're going to learn that matrix so that it does a good job on the data that we are interested in. Um, so again, the, you know the shrinkage function. Slide, here we go. Oh, I was loading the video. Um, right, so you saw that yesterday. OK, but here is a slightly better idea. So this is uh, an idea by uh, former postdoc Carl Greger. Um, and it was picked up by um, uh, a group at um, Israel and in Israel and at the University of Minnesota, uh, Guillermo Sapiro and uh, Alex Bronstein. And the idea is, um, the Carol's idea was to essentially uh, implement the, the iterative shrinkage and thresholding algorithm as a recurrent net, if you want. Okay, so we're going to try to build a feedforward neural net that actually implements the uh, ISTA algorithm. And so if you write down the, the ISTA algorithm, this is what you get shrinkage. Z of t, so z of t plus one equals shrinkage z of t minus this mess. Okay, uh, it's the same thing that I, I showed you before. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to rewrite this a little differently. Uh, z t uh, plus one here, we're going to um, uh, pre-compute the product of this matrix by that one, but we're going to replace the w d here by w e, which is a matrix we're going to learn. Okay, so this is going to be a sort of filter matrix, which you could think of as kind of the transpose modified version of a dictionary matrix. Okay, and we're going to we're going to hit um, uh, y the input vector with it. We precompute that only once, and then we run this iteration where we take the z and we multiply it by an S matrix, which is going to be analogous to uh, this product here, W D transpose by W D, um, and then shrink. Okay, so normally if you substitute S here by I minus one over L W D transpose W D, and if you substitute W E here by one over L W D, you just get is top. Okay, but we're not gonna do that. We're going to keep this W E and S as parameterized matrices, and we're gonna learn them. Now, it's a little weird because what we get here is kind of a recurrent neural, funny kind of recurrent neural net, right? Where we have a weight matrix coming here, a shrinkage nonlinearity, and then a weight matrix here, which is, you know, the the size of this squared, and then we add this to the thing we computed before, we shrink again and we iterate that. So how do we train this with backprop? And the answer is very simple, we unfold it in time. So this is shown at the bottom here. Apologize to people in the back, it's probably hard for you to see. Um, I'm not sure what I can do to make it better. Let me see. Okay, sorry about that. Um, 
Right, so what we're going to do is we're going to um, essentially unfold this in time. So do as if we, we were running two iterations of this, okay? So the first thing we do is we compute uh, y, we multiply it by we, okay? We, uh, we start with z equals zero, so this uh, here is equal to zero. We shrink, uh, then we multiply by s, and we add the result of this to whatever we computed before. And so if you unfold this, uh, you get this thing, right? You take y, multiply by we, shrink, the plus here does nothing, there's nothing to add. Multiply by s, add the result with the result you, you previously computed, the product you previously computed, shrink again, multiply by s again, and you get z after two iterations of this stuff. Okay, but now what you have is kind of a feed-forward two-layer neural net, and we know how to train that with backprop. Okay, so, uh, so we're gonna feed an input, we're gonna get a corresponding sparse code, which is obtained by minimizing the uh, L2, L1 uh, energy function for sparse coding, and then we're gonna backpropagate, we, we're gonna measure the uh, error between the, whatever this guy predicts and whatever the, uh, the optimal sparse code is, and we're gonna backpropagate the gradients all the way through, and then update the S matrix, which is shared between the two layers, and the WE matrix so that we get the answer we want. And we do this over a training set, okay? Did you end up trying this, Stan? <laughs> okay. Right. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, I mean, you, uh, well, the statement is you shouldn't use the sigma, you should just shrink or? Well, it's kind of a transpose sigmoing a little bit, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, and so the cool thing about this is that it gives you, so this is the uh, sort of um, the, the reconstruction error, if you want, um, of this algorithm after you run one iteration, two iteration, three iteration, five iteration. This is for two levels of overcompleteness. So this is uh, square, so no, you know, no overcompleteness. And this is for a factor of four overcompleteness. And this is the ISTA algorithm. And that's the, this kind of, we call it LISTA, learning ISTA, if you want. Um, and it gives you much lower error, much, much quicker than, uh, than, than ISTA. Of course, ISTA, if you keep it running, will give you the optimal answer, which this guy won't. Uh, unless you, you switch to ISTA after a while, of course, which is probably the smart thing to do if you really want the per perfect solution. It turns out we rarely want the perfect solution for the kind of applications we're interested in. Um, I guess it might be different for the kind of stuff you do, Stan, but, um, but for, for recognition, you don't necessarily want the absolute best sparse uh, representation because it may be unstable again. Okay, so how are we going to use this to train uh, recognition systems uh, or, deep, uh, or pre trained deep learning systems? So, you know, this, plays, this, this uh, autoencoder training plays the same role as uh, uh, just RBMs or, 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 you know, the prototype uh, learning that uh, Andrew was talking about yesterday or what he called yesterday RECAF. Um, and so we're going to use uh, a particular type of architecture here for a convolutional net. So as I said, uh, a, a typical stage of a convolutional net includes subtractive and divisive contrast normalization. I'm going to tell you a bit more about this uh, in a minute. Uh, filters to do convolutions, a shrinkage operation, and then a pooling operation with, and as well as spatial subsampling, which generally involves uh, L2 pooling. Um, so uh, the pooling basically computes the square root of the sum of square of the activations of, uh, of the outputs of a filter within a, within a spatial region. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about this contrast normalization business. Uh, essentially, it's a poor man's whitening. Um, so uh, Andrew was mentioning that yesterday, um, and I guess Jeff as well, that a lot of those unsupervised algorithms work better if the input is whitened. So whitened simply means that um, uh, you remove the mean from all the variables, and then you kind of uh, uh, rotate the space so that the variables are decorrelated, and then you uh, multiply the resulting variables in such a way that the variance is all one, okay? So it, you, you guys know, all know about PCA, I'm sure. So it's kind of like PCA, except you don't reduce the dimension. You just compute the eigenspace, okay? To do the, so you project the input over the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix. So that kind of rotates the space, and then you multiply every value by the, square, the inverse square root of the, uh, of the corresponding eigenvector, and that makes them all uh, unit variants, okay? That's whitening. But it's kind of an expensive operation because if you have n inputs, 
um, to your system, you have to, your, your whitening matrix is an n by n matrix. Okay, you can pre-compute it, you can pre-compute the matrix, but you still have to do the product of the matrix uh, every time you do a recognition. If you need to do this at, on every patches in an image, it tends to be really expensive. Okay, so we're going to use the poor man's version of it, which, uh, um, which consists in uh, you know, a very simple assumption, which is that um, in images or in feature maps uh, resulting from a convolutional net, uh, correlations only exist among uh, near neighbors. And so you don't need to, if you have a patch, say a 9 by 9 patch, you don't need to rotate the entire 81 dimensional uh, patch. But the only thing you need to do is essentially replace every variable by a weighted average of its neighbors that will make every variable essentially zero mean, not exactly, but sort of, locally. Okay, so if you have an image, uh, take every pixel, compute the sort of weighted average of its neighbors, maybe with a Gaussian weighting window, subtract that from the pixel, and uh, so the resulting thing you're doing is basically a high-pass filtering for people of you who have some background in signal processing. Um, and what that does is that it makes the image essentially zero mean. Um, and then the next operation is to do the same thing in the log domain, essentially. So you take every variable coming out of this, and you divide it by the standard deviation of its neighbors, again, weighted by some Gaussian windows, uh, window, if you want. Okay, so now that, that'll make, uh, and of course, if the standard deviation is too small, then you kind of have a threshold sort of uh, uh, value uh, below which you don't do the normalization. Um, so the result of this is that now every, every uh, you know, areas of the image where you have very small variations where the edges are faint and things like this, they will be amplified. And areas of the image where you have very strong um, edges, they'll be kind of uh, diminished a bit so that you get sort of a uniform um, uh, sort of contrast, if you want. It's like contrast normally. It's like uh, adaptive gain control a little bit. I Eric. Boundary condition. Right. Um, so, so here's the cool thing. Once you do the high-pass filtering, you can pretty much assume that uh, the sort of default value now is zero. So you can extend the border of the image to zero, and then you can do the, you know, the rest of the, of the image. So you can do this without, without wasting the border of your image, basically. Uh, but it's a little tricky. So that code is all implementing in Torch. So um, if, you, if you run the demo, if you look at the code and how it's written, you'll, you'll see some details of how this is done. Um, so this is for a single uh, image. But what comes out of a convolutional net after the first layer, for example, is you can think of it as a 3D array, right? Where you have two spatial dimensions, or one spatial dimension if it's temporal. And then the, 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 the first dimension is the, um, is the feature type, OK? So the result of each uh, filter goes into a different plane, a different feature map. So you can think of this whole thing as a 3D array. First dimension is fil filter, so the other two dimensions are, are space. And so you get something like this, and you do the same operation here. Replace every value by itself minus uh, weighted sum of its neighbors, but now its neighbors are, are in 3D. So you kind of uh, compute the uh, average over space and over feature type. And again, divide every value in there by the standard deviation of all the, all the neighbors. In fact, I think we use the same coefficient for all of the, all the variables here. Uh, and it's all computed with this neighbor, neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> and that turns out to be really crucial to get good performance. Um, before I show you that, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about where, how we use this autoencoder technique to train a, a pre-train a convolutional net. So you, you have this little autoencoder. You feed it with image patches from your training set. Um, and this, could, this, of course, can be unlabeled images from whatever source. Uh, you train the autoencoder until you're happy, and, and then you uh, remove the feedback um, path. So you only keep the, the feedforward encoder. So you know, uh, multiply the image by the matrix, or apply a bunch of filters, apply the shrinkage operation, and then take the absolute value. And what you get is uh, you know, a vector of absolute values, essentially. So it's really strange, but you, you keep this operation here. You rectify. And in fact, we'll see in a minute that you can include the pooling operation in there as well. OK, then, then you run your training set through this thing. You generate uh, feature maps. You take patches from it, and you run again. You train a second autoencoder on patches of first level features produced by, by this first stage. Uh, train that unsupervised remove the feedback. And well, now what you have is a, a two-stage convolutional net without the classifier, right? So you get 
filter bank, shrinkage, pooling, and subsampling. Here, um, here there's no subsampling, but um, and then again, uh, filter bank, shrinkage, uh, pooling. Let's take a classifier, and you can train your classifier in supervised mode, or you can uh, ref you know fine tune the entire architecture using using backpropagation. And the advantage of this is that it puts the system in a good starting point for backprop. Um, uh, you know, it sort of breaks the symmetry in the system. It makes sure that uh, there is as much information as possible that's propagating to the last layer. It makes sure because you know, presumably this has been trained to reconstruct the input from this feature, and this has been trained to reconstruct this feature from that feature. So that feature should contain as much in information as possible about the input as as can possibly be kept. And so it makes the you know it makes life easy for for the backprop to kind of do a good job because it basically ha has all the information it needs here, and so it's just a matter of fine tuning. Uh, so Joshua Benjo will probably talk about this um, uh, next week, but um, it's not clear to us yet. Uh, also, he's done uh, he and his group have done a lot of experiments on this to f uh, to figure out whether. The advantage of, of pre-training um, is, is purely an optimization advantage uh, that uh, puts the system in a better attractor and then you find a better solution to the, to, the, to, the, to the learning optimization. Or if it has a regularization effect, in other words, it puts the system in a region of the space where the solutions that are, are simply better. And because the attractor is not the entire space, once you pre-train the system, there is a whole area of the space of parameters that are no longer accessible to it. Uh, because you know it's already in a region of the space where you're going to train it, it's going to go down to the local minimum, but uh, but it can't go, it can't jump and go to another one. So what that means is that the uh, the size of the accessible space of the machine is much smaller uh, than than it would otherwise be, and so that might have a regularization effect. It kind of uh, has the effect of reducing the effective uh, capacity, VC dimension, whatever you want to measure it, of the of the network. And it's not clear which of those two. Um, really is the, the biggest uh, winner. I think uh, I'll let Joshua comment on this. I think he has his idea about this. So if you train this on natural images, you know, say uh, uh, 64 filters on size 9 by 9, you get uh, the, those Gibor filters. You can train the second level filters. So here these are actually the filters. They're not the uh, reconstruction what, of what, what the filter react to. but. Um, and so this is a relatively old experiment that we did with Caltech 101. So Caltech 101 is kind of has become uh, um, a data set in computer vision that people don't like to use anymore because it's very small, it's very peculiar. Um, a lot of techniques work on this, and they all pretty much get the same result. And you can, you know, you can get good results by kind of overtraining a little bit. Um, so this is a relatively old result back when Caltech 101 was still relevant. And there's one piece of information that's interesting about this, uh, and it's a word of caution. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to say the word question first, and I'm going to repeat it. The results here are really specific to Caltech 101. They don't really apply to anything else. Um, but it, but there's, one, one piece of, uh, there's one piece that applies to a lot of things, and there's one piece that doesn't. So the piece that applies to a lot of things is this. If you train a uh, purely supervised convolutional net of the type that I showed uh, Monday, which means with convolution, sigmoids, average pooling, um, and no contrast normalization or anything like that. So the, the type of convolutional nets that uh, I was playing with 20 years ago at Bell Labs, uh, and you train it on Caltech 101, you get 30% uh, 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 correct recognition. And it's terrible. Um, it's really a very bad, uh, very bad accuracy. Um, and of course, the, the, the first reason you think of is, is that uh, Caltech 101 is a very small, is a very small training set, it's, it's 3,000 training samples and 100 categories, you only have 30 training samples per category. So there's no way a, a network of that size, which has several hundred thousand parameters, will, will properly uh, learn uh, this task, right? Uh, but in fact, it's not entirely true. So uh, the first thing you can do is you can include this uh, 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 contrast normalization, and it doesn't help very much. Uh, you can use max pooling instead of average pooling. So the pooling operation, instead of computing the average over, over a window, just computes the max over a window. And that makes a big difference. So that tells you that something slightly non-linear in the pooling would probably be a good idea. So what we did was, instead of being a, an average, we, we do a, a, an average of absolute values. So, you compute, so it's basically the L1 norm pooling, if you want. 
you compute the sum of the absolute values of the of the values in the window. So that's this R abs here, um, and you get pretty much the same performance as with uh, with the max pooling. Okay, so it's really the rectification of 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 the max that has an effect, or the rectification of the absolute value that has an effect. So just this small difference here applied to uh, the output of uh, of the uh, filter and nonlinearity and uh, to do the pooling uh, makes a huge jump in performance by a factor of two. And this gets into the ballpark or striking distance of the, uh, uh, of the state of the art of the time, which was roughly 65% correct uh, using SIFT input features, uh, uh, k-means, um, vector quantization for mid-level features, uh, pyramid pooling in the last layer and a super vector machine uh, for the classifier. Yes? So uh, taking absolute value essentially loses all phase information. Do you think it's always good to lose all phase information right away? Right. So it, it loses phase information, but um, in fact it's good for you because, um, so you probably, you're, you'll hear a lot, a lot more about this from Stefan Mala next week. He'll, he'll talk about his uh, uh, scattering transform. And so, he says you should use L2 pooling, not, not L1. And in fact, we do use L2 now. This was experiments before we figured this out. And, um, and so with L2, you lose the phase. Uh, but what you gain is, um, is shift invariance, essentially. So you get robustness to shifts within you know, whatever pooling, uh, pooling region that you, uh, you do the pooling in. Sure, but for anything like trying to figure out the, the sign of contrast at a contour, right? That's, that's not really right, so it turns out the sign of contrast in a contour is, is generally, generally hurts you. It generally is it's a it's a variation you want to eliminate, which is probably why those uh, absolute values uh, rectifications uh, help. Um, right. So if uh, if you combine the absolute value and contrast normalization, you get quite a bit of a boost, and then that's pretty much the same accuracy that you would get with uh, with those sort of more mainstream uh, computer vision approaches of of the mid 2000s. Okay. This is this is sort of circa. 2006, 2000, between 2006, 2009, that's the kind of performance you would get using uh, SIF features. This is uh, a follow-up on uh, a paper by Lana Lazebnik, Cordelia Schmidt, and Jean Ponce on uh, using this idea of SIFT uh, vector quantization and pooling. Then SIFT vector quantization and pooling. She calls this uh, pyramid match kernel SVM. This is uh, it's this guy. Um, so that's interesting. What it tells you is that there are uh, architectural uh, uh, widgets that you, you that you can use in those those networks that will make a huge difference, particularly in the um, in situations where you have very few training samples. Um, now, if you use unsupervised pre-training, so this is uh, the same on the same data set using unsupervised pre-training using the sparse autoencoder uh, technique I, I mentioned earlier, or something very similar to that, uh, and then uh, supervised uh, refinement, and you get a little bit of a boost, but not a huge amount of boost uh, on this particular data set. Um, this is where the features are purely unsupervised and are not uh, refined, so only the classifier is trained. It's a little bit worse, but not that much worse, uh, except here, where it's really horrible. Okay, so unsupervised learning seems to work well if you have contrast normalization and rectification, basically. Uh, both of them. And this is the most surprising thing, uh, thing that we saw, and I don't want you to read too much into it, uh, and I'll tell you why in a minute. You, you can get almost 63% with completely random filters. So here the filters are not trained at all, no unsupervised training, no supervised refinement, random filters at both stages, only the classifier is trained. And you get pretty good performance if you have rectification and contrast normalization. You get atrocious performance for everything else. Okay, it's really not good. Uh, so you need both. If you have both, it seems to be doing a decent job. That's, unfortunately, that only applies to Caltech 101. Any other thing that we try, we don't get good performance with random filters. Uh, and so it's probably due to the fact that you know, it's, it's such a sparse data set that uh, just about anything will, 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 will do. Uh, so since then, we kind of tried a few more tricks using pyramid pooling, um, using um, uh, you know, shrinkage pyramid pooling of various kinds, and and, and various other, other tricks which I'm not going to go into and using uh, one of those sort of semi-supervised uh, uh, sparse coding pre-training. We can get it up to the low 70s, you know, like 71, 72 or something like that. Um, yeah, 71.2, I think it's just about what we get. Um, so, so here is an um, interesting uh, set of experiments which is try to try to figure out the effect of this contrast normalization. Uh, and it consists in uh, taking a, an image propagating 
propagating it through the, through the network, and then recording the, the configuration of the features, and they're using gradient descent in input space, uh, starting from random initial condition, try to reconstruct uh, what, what image would have produced this configuration, okay? So you take an image, run it through, record the features, and then you start the input image from a random, uh, random start, and then you do gradient descent in input so that the uh, feature you get uh, at the second stage is the same as what you got with the original image. And so you can see if the mapping from input to a feature is, is many to one, uh, if you don't get the same, the same input image, that means it's a, you know, a very kind of weak many to one mapping, very contracting mapping. Uh, but if you reconstruct the image, that means that most of the information in the features is preserved. So this is an original image, and that's a reconstruction you get if you don't have contrast normalization. And that's what you get if you do have contrast normalization. It's probably clearer to, uh, you know, on, on, on these examples. Uh, I'm sorry, it's the other way around. This is with contrast normalization, this is without. Um, and what you see is there's a lot more information that seems to be preserved with the contrast normalization. You're able to reconstruct the image much better than if you don't. And so what that means is that the contrast normalization has the effect of preserving more information about the input uh, in, in the features, which is probably why it, why it works. Um, and here's a, a little experiment to figure out why those random filters work at all. Okay, so these are random filters, and these are trained filters. And what we did here was try to figure out, again by gradient descent in input space, what input configuration will maximally activate a particular filter in the, in the first stage. So this is after filter, nonlinearity, and pooling. Okay, um, so basically the complex cells, the first layer, the first stage features. So if you do gradient descent um, to figure out you know, what input will maximally activate this particular unit, the unit whose receptive field is this, uh, you get a grating uh, of the same orientation and frequency as this Gibor filter. And the, the reason you get a grating is because the unit you know, pools over a certain area, so it, so it wants to have the maximum number of those units turned on within its uh, pooling area. So you get this grating. Um, and so each of those is an oriented grading, you know, corresponding to the orientation of the filters in the first place. So that makes sense. But look at this. The uh, configuration that maximally activates this filter is also a grading. And for this filter, it's also a grading. So what that means is that those units, those, those complex cells, if, even though their weights are random, because of the contrast normalization, um, they get a kind of a spontaneous uh, orientation selectivity. Okay. So the contrast normalization sort of has this sort of kind of whitening effect. So it tries to decorrelate uh, neighboring values. And so the effect is that, you know, it's sort of locally, uh, you know, cross inhibit, if you want, the activation of one filter with activation of another filter. And it sort of accentuates the, uh, um, the sort of anisotropy in the filters. If there is any kind of difference in isotropy, you know, in the, um, the filters, the difference would be, ma would, would be sort of magnified. And so you get those, uh, those, those orientation selectivity. And it's kind of interesting to know that, you know, even with random filter, you can get some vague uh, selectivity. So that's not to say that this will work well. It only works okay on Caltech 101. But there is, you know, other experiments we've done with bigger data set, the NORP data set, which uh, you may have heard of already, where uh, here we have, you know, a sizable number of training samples we tried those various things. So this is completely uh, random filters. And as you increase the number of labeled training samples, uh, the uh, error rate uh, kind of saturates. It doesn't go down very much. It's, you know, 14% or something. Uh, if you allow yourself to uh, train the filters unsupervised, you get better performance. And if you allow yourself to refine the filters uh, supervised or to pre-train and supervise and refine supervised, you get much better results. So, um, so, you know, learning the filters actually helps. Um, it's just on Caltech 101. Caltech 101 is in, in this, is in this regime here, 30 training samples per category, where basically nothing works. Uh, okay, so this was sparse coding, um, but there's a slight problem with sparse coding, which is that we, uh, in this particular way of using sparse coding, we train the or sparse coder or sparse autoencoder on patches, but then we apply the filters convolutionally. On the, on the whole image. And it's actually a waste. So a few people had the idea of uh, turning sparse coding into, uh, making sparse coding work in the context of convolutions directly. Uh, and so there is uh, work by uh, 
uh, my colleague Rob Fergus, uh, the students and postdoc, uh, Matt Zeter, Dilip Krishnan, and Grant Taylor, who is here, um, on what he calls deconvolutional networks. So you probably, you know, he'll, he'll tell you a lot about this, so I'm not going to tell you about it. But it's basically, it's convolutional nets where you reverse all the arrows. So it's kind of a generative form of convolutional nets. We start from the features and you generate the input. And so if you show, if you're being shown an input, you have to do the sort of L1 inference type thing in the convolutional net to figure out the features. Um, it's very interesting work. So they had the idea of using a convolutional uh, sparse coding uh, with a, a paper about the same, same time for sort of convolutional predictive sparse decomposition. Um, and then, you know, convolutional Boson machines are a bit of the same idea. Uh, this is by uh, Hong Lak Lee. Um, it's, you know, a bunch of, uh, of papers of this type. This a paper, this is out of Larry Karin's group at Duke University uh, using uh, architecture very similar to, uh, to Matt Zeller's deconvolutional net. Um, but they kind of automatically adjust the dimension of the code using uh, non-parametric base. Um, right, so here is the problem with uh, patch-based sparse coding. And the problem is, uh, you know, every patch, so you, you train on image patches, and so the basis functions that you're going to learn are basis functions that are able to reconstruct uh, any patch um, in isolation. And so you're going to get filters like this, you know, horizontal edge, uh, uh, Gabor edges. But what if the edge appears lower in the, uh, in, the, in the patch? Then you need to have another filter for that. And if it's lower again, you need to have another filter. And if it's higher, you need another filter. And so at the top, you need yet another filter. So the result is that you need a lot of filters to cover all possible uh, shifts or phases and orientations and frequencies uh, of the space. And of course, you can't afford to have too many filters because it would be too expensive to compute them all. So you limit this to 64, and the result is that the, the space is not uh, necessarily well, co well covered. So the idea is to turn to convolution. So um, and again, Rob will probably talk about this some more. So the idea here is that uh, normally sparse coding uh, is, you know, you, you compute a weighted sum of the columns of the, of the dictionary matrix uh, where the coefficients are the components of Z, right? So it's a, you know, sum over K, WK, ZK, where WK is a, is a vector or a, yeah, is a, is a vector and zk is a scalar. So we're going to turn zk into an image instead of a scalar. Okay, so why instead of being just a, a vector, an image patch that's vectorized, y is actually going to be an image now, and z is going to be an image, zk is going to be an image, and wk is going to be a convolution kernel. So something like this. Okay, y is an image, zk is an image, and you have multiple k, so you have multiple images. Those are feature maps, and you convolve each feature map with a convolution filter. Right? So take this map, convolve with that, take the second map, convolve with that, take the third map, convolve with that, and then add up the results. And that's your reconstruction. Um, so it, you know, mathematically, it's, the same, it's exactly the same thing. You can think of this as a very large sparse matrix. Right? You can vectorize the image, vectorize the feature maps, and this is kind of a band uh, topless matrix of some kind. Right? Uh, so there's no difference mathematically, except that the size is ridiculously large, and you can take advantage of the fact that this is a convolution. Uh, so there's certain tricks to kind of compute this fast and um, or not. And uh, I'm just going to show you one. I'm not going to show you any particular algorithm. You can, you, you can do this with FISTA or FISTA or gradient descent or whatever you want. Um, but here's the cool thing you get. So this is uh, training at the patch level. Um, I can't remember how many filters we have here, probably 128. Yeah, something like that. Um, and this is the result of training this convolutional uh, form of it. Um, so again, these are convolutional filters, whereas these are the columns of the dictionary matrix, which in effect are used as uh, convolutional filters. So here you get you know, shifted versions of the same filter, but here you don't. And because the system doesn't have to sp uh, spend all of its resources generating shifted versions of the same filters, it actually produces much more diverse filters. So it produces filters like center surround, um, basically a high-pass filter, like uh, endpoint detectors. So this is maximally active if there is a line that ends here. Uh, gratings, uh, cross detectors, another grating, um, curves, like this. So it's much more diverse. Um, yes, question. What's the, what's the Power. What do you mean by power? Uh, like I would expect the, the edges to be to appear very often, and 
Oh, I see. I see. Yeah, so some of those will turn on much more often than others. Uh, and frankly, I don't know the answer to, to that. But, but you know, certainly some of those more specialized filters will not turn on very often. Uh, you know, this one will probably turn on pretty, pretty often. Uh, uh, but the sort of high frequency gratings like this guy, probably not much. Um, right, so it's really nice, it looks really cool. Uh, on things like Caltech 101, it doesn't seem to help much. But again, Caltech 101 is kind of uh, pathological a little bit. So with the, you know, there's still experiments to be, to be done on, on, on you know, um, how well this works. So there's a few examples that where it improves quite a bit to, uh, to do this. And one example is pedestrian detection. So the video I was showing you Monday of pedestrian detection, the system was actually trained pre-trained using this uh, convolutional sparse coding, sparse autoencoder, and then refined using backprop. And there's actually quite a big, um, so we have kind of a, the latest version of it has kind of a architecture like this where we have L2 pooling. We actually use a hyperbolic tangent rather than a shrinkage here for uh, reasons that are not entirely clear. And, uh, and we have connection that kind of skip layers so that the, the classifier sees a concatenation of the, last, the, the second stage features as well as the first stage features. Um, and this idea of kind of skipping connections really, really help. The reason for having those connections that skip is that there are certain objects that you want to detect where uh, what matters is kind of the general shape of, of the object. So for that, you want high-level features. Um, to kind of take into account the, the, the whole shape, kind of have a gestalt, if you want, of the, of the, sh of the shape. But there are certain categories where what's uh, relevant to, to, uh, to classify it are very distinctive local features. So, so in fact, if, if one particular feature is detected, so that's, that's a trick that animals use, for example. So a lot of animal species have very distinctive, you know, colored patches on their, on their head or or you know, on their neck or whatever. You know, birds do this, insects do that. They have very specific patterns. And the reason is that um, you, know, you can have a very low level feature detector that detects this pattern in all your visual field and then you can just home in. So you don't need a complex visual system to be able to detect those patterns. So it's the same idea here. There are categories where if you know the particular distinctive features and you detect that, you know, it's, you know the object is there. Or, or sometimes the object is more kind of a texture rather than a shape. So for that, you want the sort of average of kind of local feature and you want to integrate that. So, so it's better for that to, to use kind of low level features and average them using pooling uh, and feed to the classifier. And in fact, um, you know, this actually brings quite a bit of improvement for pedestrian detection uh, in, uh, in error rate, as well as for things like traffic sign uh, recognition and house number verification. Not much for house numbers, but. Um, and so this is the performance for pedestrian detection. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, people who've tried uh, uh, various methods for pedestrian detection using a lot of different techniques, using uh, handcrafted features as well as sort of trained mid-level features and things like latent support vector machines or kind of movable part models uh, with uh, sort of latent position variables and shape variables. And these are all of those methods and this is uh, a convolutional net. And the way you read this is these are kind of like precision recall. So the x-axis is number of false positives per image. This line is uh, one false positive per image. And this is the, the miss rate, okay? So this is the percentage of pedestrian you miss uh, for a particular um, false positive per image. So at one false positive per image, we miss about 6.8% of the pedestrians and the other methods miss more of them. Um, and this is the difference between the, uh, the same network. This one is trained purely supervised, and this one is trained with unsupervised pre-training. So there's uh, definitely an improvement there. Uh, and these are in sort of more data sets. Uh, these are bigger data sets. This is a data set from Dagno Benz, where uh, our system gets uh, pretty much you know, state of the art. Uh, same here, same here, same here. Um, this is a, a data set with sort of relatively large uh, pedestrian. This was trained on uh, Inria, which has large pedestrians. So it's, so it's not been trained on small pedestrian, but we still test it and uh, get a state of the art here, state of the art here, state of the art here. And we're a little behind on this data set, which is the Brussels data set. Um, okay, so here's the cool thing about feature learning. You can use it for, uh, if you can use it for pixels, you can use it for other things. And in particular, you can use it for things like uh, musical genre recognition. 
so this is some work uh, done by a former master student of mine, uh, Michael Enaf. Uh, he got the best paper award at uh, Izmir, which is a music information retrieval conference. And uh, the idea here is you use uh, a very simple uh, low-level feature extraction to pre-process the, the data called constant Q transform. Uh, so it's kind of a Fourier transforms, kind of you know spectrum analysis, except you have fil filter banks that are spaced uh, with a geometric progression, so that uh, the band that a fil particular filter will re re respond to would be something like a quarter note or something like that. Okay, and you have a whole bunch of them every quarter note, and so they're spaced um, uh, geometrically. The, the the central frequency uh, progresses uh, geometrically, um, so that you have a constant number of filters per octave, in this case, uh, uh, 24 over four octaves, so a total of 96 uh, filters. So you get a 96 dimensional feature vector, and that's computed over a small segment of audio of about uh, uh, 40 milliseconds or so, 46 milliseconds. And so you transform uh, a piece of music into a series of 96 dimensional uh, uh, vectors every uh, 10 milliseconds, and they're computed over 40, 46 milliseconds. Okay, and the, what we do next is that we train one of those uh, 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 PSD, PDT sparse decomposition, sparse autoencoder, with uh, 512 uh, uh, filters. Uh, we use the encoder using the shrinkage function and rectification. Uh, we pull the response of those filters over five seconds plug this into some classifier, it could be an SVM or a re realistic regression, makes essentially no difference on the result. And then you pull the result of the classification over 30 seconds, and you take the uh, winning category as being the winning genre. And there are 10 genres in this data set. So this is uh, using the GTZAN data set, which is sort of the MNIST of, of music information retrieval, if you want. So it's kind of a little on the way out, or kind of like Caltech 101 provision, you know, it's a little bit on the way out, but, um, but it's still the, the thing people use. And so you have 10 uh, music uh, genres, uh, blues, classical, country, disco, disco hip-hop, jazz, metal, pop, and reggae and rock. And, you know, the difference between some jazz and some blues and some pop and some rock is kind of difficult. In fact, humans don't do very well on this data set. Um, and so that's the architecture. So this is sort of a depiction of the constant Q transform where uh, you know, time goes uh, vertically here and frequency is uh, horizontally. Contrast, contrast in normalization, uh, filters, shrinkage, max pooling, linear classifier, and then pooling over, over 30 seconds. Um, so that's, that's, where, that's how it looks uh, after normalization. And the cool thing is that you, you look at the, the filters that are trained, they're not Gabor filters, of course, because they're trained on this uh, uh, frequency vectors, but there are things like uh, chords, essentially. So that's one of the basis functions. It's looking at, uh, at, at one octave in that case, and it's detecting a minor third. So if, if you look at what those filters correspond to, they're spaced by exactly a minor third. And that's a quarter chord, that's a major triad, a major chord. Uh, perfect fifth. And so you have those kind of chord detectors that the system spontaneously learns uh, using unsupervised learning. The full octave features are a lot more complicated. You get sort of, you know, um, sort of harmonic uh, stacks and things like that. Um, these are the basis functions. So you see those, uh, those guys really detect local motifs in the uh, in the, the frequency. So frequency is, is vertical and time is uh, horizontal here. Other basis functions. And we get 83.4% uh, with some you know, variance. This is using cross-validation. Uh, the best known method uh, uses uh, actually a deep belief net. This is uh, work by Doug Eck, who used to be at University of Montreal. He's now at Google. And, uh, and they use kind of deep belief nets with uh, a nonlinear SVM on top and they get pretty much the same performance, just a little better. Uh, there are other methods that use lots and lots and lots of different features, plug into an Adaboost classifier to get pretty close. Um, and then there are two results here. Uh, they get much better than everybody else, but nobody believes them. So um, in fact, there's even a paper that sort of shows that there is a methodological problem with one of those two papers, and the other one uses the same method. So basically, they're not kosher. Um, I don't want to say anything bad, but um, I've been told um, by people who try to reproduce the result that there is kind of a methodological issue with it. 
Um, okay, so let me stop here if you have a few questions.